All right, there we go. Okay, I think we got it. So um, I showed this last year when I talked about uh, uh, whether chemotherapy is here to stay, and I think we agreed it was and still is. This was sort of the history of lung cancer uh, and the drugs that were approved by the FDA over four decades. Um, that slide obviously hasn't changed, but uh, this slide has changed. So this is in the last five years. There have been more drugs approved in the last five years in lung cancer than the whole history of lung cancer. And in the last year, since our last meeting, there are five drugs approved. So that's unprecedented in this, this area. We'll be talking a lot about these uh, drugs and the, the advances that have been made because of this, the wonderful benefits we've seen in our patients uh, from targeted therapies, from uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, from uh, novel chemotherapy drugs, from biologics. So they, they have a role. We'll, we'll be spending the next couple of days really focusing on the benefits, but we also need to talk about the reality of what's happening uh, in the healthcare system and the cost of these drugs are realized to the patients. But before I talk about oncology, let me say we're, we're not in this alone. I think this is a great example uh, from our friends in cardiology. Uh, Alirosumab and Evolusumab are two agents that were approved. They are PCSK9 inhibitors. I'll tell you what that is in a minute. And they were approved by the FDA in June as an adjunct to diet and maximally tolerated statin therapy for the treatment of adults with heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia and clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease who require additional lowering of LDL cholesterol. So these are first-in-class fully humanized monoclonal antibodies. They inactivate this uh, pro-protein convertase subvalicin kexin type 9, PCSK9. So uh, and what, what, is that, what happens then? Well, this inactivation leads to decreased LDL receptor degradation, increased receptor recirculation of hepatocytes, and consequent lowering of LDL cholesterol. The FDA approval is based on surrogate endpoints of LDL cholesterol reduced uh, by 38 to 62 percent with one drug and 47 to 56 percent uh, for the other agent. And this was a publication in the England Journal really by some of the advisors to the FDA talking about these breakthrough drugs and the potential benefit they would offer. Interestingly, um, this was based on surrogate endpoints. There was really no data in terms of clinical benefit. That's still to follow. Um, so we'll see if, in fact, lowering cholesterol through with these new exciting agents will really improve cardiovascular event rates or not. Now, at the same time, uh, Kevin Schulman from our institution, um, who's a health economist, um, health economist um, looked at one of these drugs. Uh, and said, you know, the price of this drug is $14,600 uh, per patient per year. And he did some calculations. 27% of the U.S. population, adults 40 to 64, have a high LDL cholesterol. If only 5% of these took an inhibitor, uh, and there's a 100% reduction in the cardiovascular event rate, which, which is not known at this point. Um, and assuming about a 25% reduction in drug costs that might happen, the end result would be if you were in an insurance pool, you'd be paying, every person in that pool would pay another $124 a year for people in that pool to be able to receive this drug. Um, in addition, that's, that's just in that insurance pool. In the Medicare population, the same thing will happen. And again, taxpayers will be the ones uh, that will be faced with those costs. So this is one drug and, and, and just one good example of how that's going to affect everybody, not just the patients. So what's really driving these costs? Uh, Kevin Schumann talked a little bit more about that. So the healthcare market has limited tools to restrain the pricing power of suppliers. There's this concept of price inelasticity. Uh, it's a result of an industry that relies on third parties. So insurance, as we know, and the government really pay the cost of these agents by and large. And we're not selling them directly to consumers. And it's really the consumer where affordability is a critical factor that really regulates the market if you're buying a Lexus or a Buick. Um, and that doesn't happen with, with drugs. So the current pricing model dr is driven by transformation in the pharmaceutical industry as well, where 84% of prescriptions right now are filled with generics and biosimilars. So the revenue for investment and innovation really have to come from new drugs. Uh, that's also driving the market. So um, that was Kevin's take on this. Then Zeke Emanuel, uh, Rahm's brother, the mayor of... Uh, Chicago, and Zeke is an oncologist, many of you may know him. He's advised the White House on costs of care. He's 
currently a dean at, at Penn. So he looked at this and had an editorial in the New York Times saying, I am paying for your expensive medication just to get the idea out there that we're all in this together. Uh, and he talked about how one might uh, address this from a value standpoint and look at quality adjusted life years as one potential mechanism for this. And his estimates would be, um, again, assuming the benefits that uh, Kevin Schulman was talking about, that these inhibitors would cost about $300,000 per quality of uh, adjusted life year per patient. So how are we going to bring these costs down even for the cholesterol drugs? Well, it will take either a drug industry that will self-regulate itself, which is not likely to happen anytime soon, or government regulation, also something that's in the distant future. So really, I think in the meantime, I think it really falls on us as providers to try to get into this game and understand a little bit better what we might be able to do. So the first thing we might be able to do is understand this equation. So it's pretty simple. Value. We need to be talking about value. We're really focused, all of us, I think, myself included, on benefit. We want to know what the benefit of treatments are for our patients, what the net gain is in terms of survival after what toxicities there might be. And that's really where most of the focus is. That's what we'll be talking about for the next two or three days, benefits. But we have to also look at the cost, the cost of those benefits, and really uh, think about that in a more holistic way. So when we think about value, we have to think about value to the society and to patients. Uh, if we take the society perspective first, uh, it's pretty staggering. So this is just looking at the uh, cancer costs in the United States. Uh, they're in the $120, $130, $140 $1 billion a year range and going up steadily as predicted. And these rates of increase are really based simply on the increased rates of cancer that will happen as, as the population ages. It's assuming that the costs of care are not really going to change. And we know that's not going to happen. This paper was written in 2011. We didn't have immune checkpoint inhibitors. We didn't have a lot of therapies then we have now. So these numbers are really a way uh, underestimate of the, the costs that we're going to be facing. And this is particularly an interesting slide. Peter Bach put this together um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering. If one looks back in the 70s, the cost of drugs were $100 a month, maybe less. Mitomycin C was $5 a month when it got approved. Now, maybe that's all mitomycin C is worth, uh, but uh, it was certainly uh, a very different climate then. So um, mitomycin C in here was, was, was very low. Um, and in the next decade or two, when we got to the 90s, the decade of the cytotoxics, most of these drugs were in the, maybe $1,000, $2,000 a month of cost. We thought that, that was outrageous. But now we're really looking at costs that are way up uh, about $10,000 a month on average. So this is obviously not a sustainable situation for anybody. Now, in uh, the address that uh, Len Saltz did at ASCO, he looked at some of the, this information. And as you know, he focused particularly on the immune checkpoint inhibitors and what the dose might be. So if one uses 10 milligrams instead of two for, um, for uh, pembrolizumab, you potentially could have drug costs annually of a million dollars per year at the, 10, at the 10 milligram dose rather than the two milligram dose. Fortunately, with the lower dose, but we're still talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in drug costs for many of the drugs we're, we're now using. So uh, let's use an example, and I'm not making an example of any one particular agent. It's just that uh, a study was done before Nesitumab, before its recent approval. Um, the Squire trial was the one that had advanced squamous carcinoma. Nesitumab was added to chemotherapy. It improved the median overall survival by 1.6 months. And as you know, it was approved in the last two weeks by the FDA uh, for these pa this patient population. The incremental survival benefit is 0.15 life years. Uh, 0.11 quality adjusted life year. And so if you do an incremental cost effectiveness rating uh, analysis, that turns out to be approximately $500 to $1,000 per cycle or $100 to $200,000 per quality life year adjusted. So this was, uh, if one was pricing the drug in a reasonable range, and $100 to $200,000 per quality life year is sort of a, a reasonable range today. That drug would have to be priced at $500 to $1,000 per cycle. And I think we know that's probably not the case. I don't know if anybody know the price of Nesitumab? Nobody's owning up to 
I, I think we can assume it's going to be more than $10,000 a month because all the other drugs are, are in that range. So it's really tenfold what uh, would be cost effective or a reasonable investment, at least by the, this kind of analysis. So, but I think if we were in the position to make this kind of an analysis before a drug was approved and impact the cost and charge, we would do that. Uh, but unfortunately, we're not. So what's driving this uh, in addition, biologics, uh, such as uh, mesotumab and others in 2003, they were a small part of the, of the whole drug pie. Now they're almost half. And so the biologics themselves are clearly driving some of the healthcare costs. Uh, the other thing that's driving costs are even after drugs are approved, their price is not static. I always thought if a price, you know, if a drug comes on the market, the price is going to come down from competition over time. But in fact, uh, what happens? Okay, is for example, there are a lot, and the, the price has actually gone up from 2007 to 2014, almost double. Um, and that's uh, the price on the left there is dollars per pill. It's $100 a tablet. Now it's almost $200 a day. And that's not only true for allotment. It's true for multiple other agents. Uh, the satinib, not the most user-friendly uh, pointer. And also imatinib. So I think we're seeing the majority of drugs increase in, in time in terms of their price after approval due to a number of market forces. So it's, it's an issue. Now, the other major driver of this, of course, is drug development. So if you look in uh, 1980, it cost $320 million to develop a drug. In 2014, it's $2.6 billion. Um, I thought all that was CROs, but it's not. It's, not. Uh, it's actually some of it's preclinical as well as clinical development. About 50-50 in terms of some of the costs. And the Tufts Center has done a nice job of kind of analyzing some of this, but clearly it's a, a rampant excess in terms of costs. So the other problem, of course, is the cost is going up, but uh, if you can see that, perhaps, um, the five-year survival went from 49% to 68%, but it sort of leveled off at 67% for cancer. So the rising costs for drug development are not yet matched by improvement in five-year survival. So clearly, uh, we have to do better. So what about from the patient perspective? And that's what I really want to spend the, most of the time on, uh, and take advantage of one of my uh, faculty who's done a lot of this work. Um, if you look at what patients want, obviously they want to be cured of their cancer. If they can't be cured, they want the most quantity of life possible. Uh, if they can't have that, they want the best quality. And down the line is cost. So cost is really not something they think about either. Um, so that, that's a problem. But they also don't often understand what they're getting when we talk about the treatment. What are they really getting? Are they getting a cure? Are they getting longer survival? Are they getting a better quality of life or something else? So if one looks uh, at a study that was done and published in JAMA uh, Oncology earlier this year, this took uh, about 20 different cancer drugs that were approved around 2013, 2012, 2013, and looked at the drug price on one axis and the improvement in overall survival on the other axis. And you can see there really isn't a linear relationship. The R, R squared is not very uh, substantial there. And so there's no real relationship between how much improvement one gets in outcome and what the cost of the drugs are. So that again fits with this inelasticity of the, the model and the fact that pricing is more based on what the market will bear than a anything else. Um, and then there's some, some drugs that have huge increases. So there's a 20% incremental improvement in survival at a cost of $200,000 a year. So pretty substantial increase. So that's a problem. Um, so th this, is, this is some data from uh, Yusuf Safar, who is an oncologist at Duke, a, a young, very uh, uh, entertaining and successful oncologist who really got into this early in his career. And if you didn't, uh, coined the term financial toxicity, he certainly made the most of it. So he wants us all to think about financial toxicity the way we think about neutropenia and 
uh, nausea and vomiting and rash and other things. So we just have to face this as another toxicity our patients are undergoing. And so what he's done are a number of different surveys. This is just one at Duke where he, they just ask patients well, how they had to change their, uh, their lives based on their treatment. So the majority had to give up vacations. A lot of them cut down on their grocery expenses. Um, many of them depleted their savings to pay for their uh, costs of care. Um, financial toxicity also included the fact that half of them would be willing to declare bankruptcy to undergo the treatments they thought would help their cancer treatments. Uh, almost uh, that many would be willing to sell their homes, and uh, two-thirds would be willing to spend less on food and clothing. So clearly, it's impacting our patients substantially uh, on a daily basis. Um, if one looks at 50% uh, of Medicare beneficiaries in another study, uh, spent 10% just on drugs alone out of pocket of their uh, out of pocket expenses. 28% of Medicare beneficiaries spent 20% or more out of pocket expenses. And that, those numbers are going up and are estimated to become even more staggering. So it's not only the out of pocket expenses, what's happening is uh, fortunately, as inflation has occurred, we are seeing that there's a rise in worker earnings to match inflation. But look at how much in premiums have gone up, insurance premiums over that time period, uh, and workers' contributions to those premiums at the same rate. So, so a lot more money is being paid by all of us for our insurance. At the same time, deductibles are going up. So it's not just out-of-pocket expenses. It's deductibles. It's insurance premiums, uh, all because we're paying for that cholesterol drug and, uh, and probably the immune checkpoint inhibitor drug. So. What does all that impact? How does that impact our patients other than financially? Well, what happens if one looks at the stress of patients under high financial burden, pretty good data, again, from a, a sort of a national study that USEF has led, showing the quality of life among patients uh, and active cancer survivors is clearly impacted by this. In addition, another study showed that a lot, that patients had a lot of cancer related financial problems. They were four times less likely to afford good or better quality of life. So it clearly is having an impact on the quality of life as well. And if we look at uh, compliance, it's substantially affected. This is a study uh, looking at uh, Gleevec in patients. 70% of patients who had financial concerns were 70% uh, more likely to have non-adherence than patients who had less financial concern. So, uh, and then this year at ASCO, um, uh, a study was done actually by uh, uh, in Western Washington that looked at bankruptcy. And the bank bankruptcy rate among cancer patients is two and a half times greater than uh, the regular population. They, they then looked at that population with, uh, who declared bankruptcy and looked at mortality and uh, did match controls. And there was a 79% greater mortality. So again, we don't know what the relationship is. We don't know that's because they didn't undergo treatment or um, the stress of this or whatever. But it appears, at least observationally, the financial stress, it, when it leads as far as bankruptcy, may impact long-term outcomes in terms of survival. By the way, Yusuf really likes these big numbers. I think it's just, I, mean, I don't really think we're too old to see smaller numbers. It just it makes a bigger impact, but it seems to work for them. Okay. Um, Better than this plan is working for me. Okay, so we have this, this issue of extreme financial distress, greater risk of mortality. We have an impact of, on well being, we have an impact on health related quality of life, uh, and possibly quality of care because patients aren't um, compliant with their regimens and maybe not seeking the, the care that they need. So it's a, it's, it's a problem. So if we address this, we can address this at the policy level, the provider level, the patient level. If you look at the policy level, um, President Bush uh, did his best with, in, uh, with the Medicare Modernization Act to try to help our seniors and help uh, health care. But along with that, what, what came was sort of this uh, policy, and that's that uh, in order to promote competition, the Secretary of Health and Human Services may not interfere with negotiations between drug manufacturers and pharmacies, and they may not require a particular formula or institute a price structure for reimbursement. 
So basically, Medicare has no impact on pricing. The FDA, by law, has no impact on pricing. They can only look at benefits and, uh, and toxicity and, and are disavowed to do any of this. So basically, the government's hands are tied in any kind of control at, under the current guidelines in terms of trying to control pricing. So an alternate proposal, obviously, would be to look and say, well, maybe what we should do is pay for responders. If you're a responder to treatment, yeah, we'll pay for the treatment. But if you're not responding, maybe there should be some kind of discount on treatment. So that's not going to happen in the US anytime soon. But in the UK, there's a proposal for bortezomib. Um, if you get a 50% reduction in your serum M protein by your fourth cycle, that's good. They'll pay for the drug. But if you don't, the drug's free. So that would be a pretty startling uh, change in policy for something like that to happen here, but uh, it, it's one potential way to look at things. So the other thing, I, of course, is just to be more transparent about pricing and understand uh, what the costs of care are with our patients. Uh, so one of the other studies Yousef did was he um, asked patients if they discussed the cost of care uh, with their provider. And it turns out 52% wanted to discuss costs, but when they actually looked, only 19% actually were willing to actually talk about costs uh, with their providers. So when they asked the patients, well, why didn't you do that? Why didn't you talk to your doctor about your treatments? Well, 43%, well, we didn't have any difficulties with costs. I bet that number is going to go down. Um, and 28% wanted the best care, so they didn't want cost to be a factor. They were afraid if they brought it up, maybe uh, they wouldn't get the same care they would otherwise. 18% thought it wasn't the doctor's job. We like those people, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, I think it's going to be our job. Uh, another 18% figured we couldn't help them. They, they might be right there, but um, and 9% uh, wanted to talk to someone else, and another 9% said they were just too embarrassed to talk to uh, to their providers about this. So. So Susan um, Black and I have a practice together for the last 25 years. So Susan heard this presentation. She went back to clinic that day. Um, one of our prize patients was there. We've been taking care of her for over four years with stage four lung cancer. She's 50 years old. She's a social worker from Columbia. Um, she's been in good health. She's worked throughout her treatment. Her husband is, um, does some farming and teaching the community college. They're always there for their appointments. They're always pleasant. They've been through Tarsiva and chemotherapy and radiation. on the Bolumab now. Um, so soon, and they, we have a little box in our uh, distress score that says financial problems, check it off. Ne they never checked it off. So Susan just said, well, how are things going financially for you all? And she just broke down in tears. Just, just, just couldn't, uh, couldn't deal with it. And she was embarrassed. She just couldn't bring, again, probably all these things were answers for her. She didn't really want to interfere with her care. They thought it was their burden. They should just take care of it. Um, but it just shows it's, it's a discussion we have to start. Uh, and sometimes we, we have to start it because patients may not bring it to our attention. So uh, what happened as a result of this? Um, in discussing these costs, it decreased expenses in 57% of patients. And if one looked, uh, what are some of the ways that they were decreased? Well, MD referred the patient for financial assistance, uh, advocated for the patient to the insurance company, Switch to less expensive medications, change tests, or decrease the number, uh, or decrease the number of MD visits. So, it's a small study, but it does suggest that we can impact, uh, at least in a small way, uh, for indiv individual patients, uh, some of the financial burdens they may be facing. So, we come back to value, benefit, cost. So, we've been talking about cost. Well, the other thing we need to talk about is benefit. We all talk about benefit, but we, we usually look at a survival curve and see how much difference there is in median survival. But we've got to take this to a different level. So obviously, ABIM and others, ASCO, have talked about choosing wisely so we can kind of really, really target better what our benefits are. Um, ASCO has uh, developed a little bit further, and this, uh, I don't know if you've seen this, this is a, uh, a net health benefit model where one can look at uh, clinical benefit, toxicity, uh, some bonus points, net health benefit. One can do some calculations to try to figure out what the overall costs are per patient. I think this is a first effort. I think this would be pretty complicated. Um, I doubt if many of our, uh, us are actually going to do that. 
but uh, but it's at least a step in trying to quantitate uh, what the benefit is in terms in terms of cost to the patient. Meanwhile, ESMO has this thing called the ESMO Magnitude of Clinical Benefit Scale, and they've got it separated into curative and non-curative settings, and they've ranked um, different therapies based on the level of benefit. So if curative benefit A, for example, if you improve survival at three years by 5%, that's an A, and lesser improvements are B and C, and non-curative, they have some other categories, but then that gets assigned to the treatment, and so if patients are uh, and providers are looking at treatments, they have a sense for how much clinical benefit there really is to that therapy that they're looking at. And the one that I think may impact us the most is the NCCN. So uh, if you've seen this, these are evidence blocks. Anyone's, anybody seen this? All right, good. So it hasn't come to lung cancer yet. Um, well, I talked to Dave Ettinger yesterday, and he, they're working on this. Um, so this is an idea of taking the guidelines, which in the NCCN have always been independent of cost, and try to put more of a value uh, on the guidelines and the recommendations. So what happens here in the top column, if you can see it, uh, the first box is efficacy. What's the efficacy of the regimen? Is it highly effective? Is it minimally effective? Is it palliative? Uh, the second box is, is safety. Is it uh, universally... Uh, with no toxicity or is it highly toxic? And you rank that, that second column. The third is quality of evidence. Is it uh, high quality evidence or poor quality? Uh, the fourth is consistency of evidence. Uh, is it highly consistent or inconsistent? And the, and the fifth, importantly, is affordability. So is it very inexpensive, inexpensive, moderately inexpensive, expensive, or very expensive? Well. Most of our drugs are going to be one. They're going to be in that. They're going to be over in that last column. They're going to be in the very expensive category. So really, to compensate for that, it's going to take really fairly consistent evidence of benefit in these other columns. And I think the idea of the evidence blocks will be they'll be added to each of the guideline recommendations. So it won't be you can pick between 20 different drugs and pick whatever you want. There'll really be some more granularity for where the benefit might might end. Now again, this is going to be pretty much consensus and there will be problems with all this, but I think it's at least a step at trying to take guidelines a step further than just uh, where they are currently. So in, in the end, what can we do? Well, you know, at the provider patient level, I think there's some things we can do and I think you can all think of things that can add to this, but um, as clinicians, for, first, we have to uh, show the clinical evidence of benefits and risks of any treatment need to be well communicated with our patients. Hopefully we're doing this, but we probably need to do this a lot better than we have. Secondly, we really have to understand the financial impact on patients and families and make sure that's part of our discussion with them on a regular basis, not wait for them to bring it to us because they often won't do that. And third, I think we have to, uh, we have a lot to be enthusiastic about in lung cancer compared to where we've been, but we can't let that enthusiasm for our new treatments replace thoughtful patient management. Um, and then last, um, Maybe, maybe, I, maybe I was last. <laughs> um, um, last, what, what, what can we do as investigators? Well, I think there are a number of things we can do as well. First, at Duke, all our fellows, when they give a talk, they have to incorporate some financial discussion in their talk, whatever the talk is. So there's no reason we can't and shouldn't be doing that. So when we give a talk on whatever the latest cancer drug is, we usually have a slide on safety. That's it but we need to have a slide on financial toxicity as well and talk about that, at least talk about how that's going to impact overall costs, plus and minus. And that should be routine in any of our talks moving forward. Secondly, for drugs and development, if we're involved with them, we really have to advocate for biomarker development and validation in the early phase trials. We're all believers in that, but I think we have to do that to a greater extent so that we can take advantage of more targeted approaches for our patients and guide phase three strategies and ultimate approval. Because I think the wide approvals are going to, where there's a low response rate, are really driving a lot of the care costs that we're facing now. And then for the approved agents, those already out there where we're, where we're not very selective in their use and when we know the response rates are low, let's try to understand better what the responder, non-responder populations really are like. We can do that probably from clinical trials already done to some extent, but I think what it's going to take is patient registries. And I know a number of the immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, will, be, will be undergoing patient registries where 
we'll get an idea of what the impact is at the clinical level, at the community level for these patients in terms of benefit, risk, and financial toxicity. And so I think from some of that, we'll hopefully be able to refine how to better use these drugs moving forward. So uh, I will stop there and uh, take any questions. Thanks. Dave. It, it's um, yeah, no, I do, I do. Well, obviously, you know, the long-term survivors are driving a little bit of the cost, but most of the cost is driven by the that front end of people that are getting it for a couple of months and coming off and not getting benefits. So that's what's that's what's raising the benefit, uh, raising the cost per life year, if you will, uh, is that huge group of patients who aren't going to benefit in the long run. Uh, if, if the patients are if everyone is responding and, and living three years, and you know that's very different than the one that's only going to live ten days longer. So uh, the overall ca calculation is a population-based calculation. Um, so I think that the, the way to ad address that are, are several. One is trying to select patients better up front so we don't treat everybody with that agent. Two, when we do treat them, to get out sooner. So we'll talk a lot about immune checkpoint inhibitors in the next few days. Clearly, wonderful drugs, great responses. But for the non-responders, um, you know, it's not very toxic. You know, well, the patient didn't respond, but they're, they're not getting worse. I think I'll just leave them on it. That, you know, that kind of strategy is, is really not going to be a good thing. So we're going to drive up the healthcare costs by using drugs that aren't working for our patients but not stopping them. So, and then third, I'd say, for the patient on PEM, I've got those patients too. Do they, do they really still need, are they still benefiting from the PEM at Trex at three and four years? Do we, we need somebody that wants to do some randomized discontinuation trials. PMS has done that with nivolumab. We'll see if that, at a one-year point, to find out if if longer-term therapy is necessary or if one can stop and reintroduce it later. So I think there are a lot of questions that maybe they're not the most exciting questions to, to address, but if we don't address some of them, uh, we won't be in this business. Go ahead. That was a great talk, uh, Jeff. You know, five, ten years ago, immunotherapy was the last day, the last talk, and none of us was uh, very uh, immunologists. Today, we all need to learn immunology, and uh, two-thirds of the meetings are about immunology. I think we will see the same here. I think you are absolutely right. Uh, this will be an increasing uh, impact uh, also in the academic setting and over discussions. And related to that, to that I would like to say that um, ISLC, has started focusing on it. Uh, we have just established a task force, and I would like to invite you to participate, by the way. Here's what's happening. <laughs> you give one uh, talk on something. We, 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 <laughs> we, uh, we have a plan on focusing on, on lung cancer, of course, and we do that in collaboration with ASCO uh, these days. So I, I, I agree with you, this will get more and more space uh, at our meetings in the future. Yeah, I think so. I, I think right now, the New York Times is beating up on cardiology, but it's, they're coming after us. And Dave's right, those patients are getting those treatments for years and years and years and for a small incremental benefit, and so, so the costs add up. But, but you know, we're, we're looking at drugs that are 10 times the cost of those, those cholesterol drugs I talked about, so it's an issue. Jeff, as one reads into this issue, one of the things that comes up is in oncology, the drug costs only account for 10 to 15 percent of entire expenses involved. So even if the drugs were reduced by half the price, 
you're still not going to get a big chunk out of the pie. Obviously, every quit helps. Uh, so what is being done for the rest of the 80-85% of uh, oncology care? Yes, uh, <laughs> that's another talk. The, uh, um, my understanding is that drug costs about 25%. Of, 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 and it's, and it's, a fra it's the biggest growing fraction. So uh, I mentioned at the beginning that over a five-year period, global uh, drug costs went from 71 to 91 billion dollars. So, so it's it's clearly moving fast, and that's why it's a target to control. And I think um, you know some of the what, what's being done at other levels, obviously, you know, shorter hospital stays and you know, multiple other things to try to con contain costs. And there, you know, third parties can you know, they have ratcheted down some of that because they they do by what we're paid. For hospitalization, that's having some impact on those costs, where the drug costs are just uncontrolled. So I think that's you know, that's a big issue. But there are clearly people know that other field better than I do. I think that ASCO What's and that? right, right. So I. I I gloss over. They have different categories where they tr their cost offsets from different things that are done. I think ASCO and ISLAC could take a, a policy on advertising. Uh, it's ridiculous that these ads are so misleading for patients on TV. And uh, I fill up a wastebasket of junk. You know, the societies take all the advertising revenue, but there's no value to those magazines that we throw away. There's no educational value. They're just full of advertisements. And I think the societies should come out and refuse to take advertising money and uh, protest all these advertisements on TV, which I think are frankly misleading to patients. Agreed. Yeah. Okay.